same with you can do Oh God of wonders Your power has no end The things you've done before In greater measure You will do again Cause there's no prison Boy, you can't break through No mountain you can't move on Things are possible And there's no broken body You can't raise No soul you can't save Oh, things are possible
Sometimes in these mo moments when the spirit is moving, we can kind of get in our head and start thinking about all the things or even the plans that he gives us. And I just encourage you, set that aside right now. This mind needs to submit to what the spirit is saying, but also to peace. Because we can get so spun up just thinking about all that goes into the move of God, that he wants to make it an easier way. But we decide, oh, you know what, I've got this figured out. He gave me the, he gave me the big picture, but I'm going to go ahead and now take over. And that is when we can start to get in the way, at least of God using us, using us to bring about this revival that we so long for, this awakening in the hearts of believers that's going to change the world. So, Lord, right now we say we submit our intellect, we submit our minds, because we know that no matter how intelligent we can become, it will never compare to the knowledge and wisdom that you have. Lord, to the perfect application of that knowledge and wisdom that you have. Lord, we cannot comprehend your greatness. So, Lord, we say we submit fully to you because you are our living hope. Lord, everything in this world will fail us, but you have remained consistent from the beginning and will remain consistent to the very end. So we thank you right now in this place for that. And as we sing this last song that's called Living Hope, Lord, we want to rest in that fully. We want to buy in and believe it, that our faith would be built so we can move mountains. Maybe not physical ones, because there'd be no need right now, but Lord, there are strongholds, principalities, chains that represent those mountains. And Lord, without you and without our faith combined, we can't move them. So Lord, we say, come and move in us first so that we can submit to you and move these mountains. Amen. Amen. the 
We are narrowing in on Easter Sunday, and uh, it's going to be a powerful time. Man, what a powerful time of worship we've had today. The presence of the Lord is here, and He's real. And uh, we want people to know that. We want people to know the hope that we possess. And so now is the time to invite your neighbors, your co-workers, let them know um, join you on Easter Sunday morning, but every week, invite someone to come and experience real life. Uh, that's why I love our church name, because that's what Jesus came to give us, real life. He came to move us from death to life, and he came to bring that message to the world. It's not just a message for you and I, not just a message for us to walk out of here and hold and to know and to have confidence, but it's so that we can tell the world, we can tell our coworkers, our neighbors, our friends, those that we encounter, that we have moved from death to life and there is hope and there is redemption and there is forgiveness to do the same thing. So as we move into the word today, I want us to open our heart. And as we have already experienced the presence of God and he is still in the room, the Holy Spirit is moving, that today he'll move upon us. And I want to pray over us as we receive this word. Lord, in your parable, in the gospel, you said that the only word that can be stolen by the enemy is, is ground that is hardened says that the sower went and he threw out seed, but because the ground was hardened, that the birds came and they took the seed from them. Today, I pray that would not be our heart. Lord, we've all experienced things. We've all experienced drama and trauma, and we've had these things that can pat down the path. Some of us have been in church all of our life, and maybe we've heard some of the things I'm going to say today. But God, I pray by your Spirit that it would become fresh to us, a fresh seed of your Word to go into our heart. And Lord, I pray over that seed, over every fertile heart, over every fertile mind, over every fertile soul, Lord, that as that seed goes down into the ground of their life, that it would produce a harvest of righteousness, a harvest of peace, a harvest of life and life to the full, because that's what you came to give us. Life. Life. I pray this in the mighty and the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, let me just, if you weren't with us last week or you're joining us online and you haven't, didn't start with the beginning of our series, uh, you can watch that online on our Facebook page or our YouTube uh, channel. Make sure to like or subscribe to either of those. And uh, we, we started this journey at the transfiguration of Christ. That just means that he was transformed. They saw him in a new way. And I think it's important in our Christian life or in life in general to see God in new ways. Because if you've served Christ for as long as I have, for many, many years, I gave my heart to Christ at the age of five years old. I was led to Christ by a puppet, so that may explain a lot of things. But I remember at a children's crusade coming to the altar and asking Jesus, wanting to know this Savior that this puppet was talking about. And I gave my heart to Christ. I didn't know that I would be in ministry. I didn't know that anything like that would happen. But I know that God did something in my heart because on the very next day, my dad had made these bright fluorescent uh, pink flyers for our crusade. And the next day when I got home from school, I went door to door passing out these flyers not to just come and have fun at church, but something had happened in my life that I wanted others to experience. God had moved me from death to life. God had moved my heart and impassioned it from death to life. He had, he had brought me to life. And I really believe in this season that we're in, where God is pouring out His Spirit as we talked uh, last week 
is God is awakening his church. God is awakening our hearts. There is something happening. There's something happening today in this room. There's something happening in the lives of children. You see all the kids today? Oh my goodness. Come on. Thank you, Lord. God is moving in their heart. And there's a hunger that is arising. Not just for the word. I love the word of God. Not just for rules and regulation, but for the spirit of life, the spirit of God that will breathe on it and make it live. In Matthew 17, they saw Jesus in a different way, a different way than they experienced before. It's much like what is happening in heaven today. Do you realize for eons and eons more time than we can begin at the beginning of the alpha where god was that the angels the cherubim that sit at the bema seat that that literally hold their their wings over the face of god that they continually day and night cry out worthy Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy, worthy. They are crying out and worshiping over God. Now, you would think after a few weeks, if it was you and I, that we would get tired of singing the same song. But here's what I believe happens in heaven. Every time they get a new glimpse of God, every time they see and they get a, they, they behold him with their eyes, when they hear his voice, when they see who he is, it creates a restart, a refreshing of his spirit in their life. And I believe that God wants us to see him in that way. And I believe what God wants to do is not just give us a glimpse so that we can have an experience but God wants to put the sustain pedal on this thing until the day he returns that God will pour out his spirit that the church would be empowered that the church would see him in a new and fresh way and they would never be the same again that Christianity that we had yesterday would not look like the Christianity we have today that we are literally going from glory to glory and faith to faith. And it's not just because we're quoting scripture. Anybody can say glory, glory, and faith to faith, but it takes the transformation of the Holy Spirit working in our life to make that happen. So God was creating... In the life of Peter, James, and John, he was showing himself. They had seen Jesus. They had been with Jesus. Matthew chapter 16, he says, who do people say I am? And they said, they're a prophet. You're a good guy. You're, you know, a great neighbor. You're a good son. And all those things may have been true about Jesus. But what he really wanted to know is what they thought. Because oftentimes our opinion of things can be shaped by culture. Our opinions on what we believe can be shaped by what someone else told us. See, my parents told me about Jesus. My parents took me to church four times a week. Anybody gone to church four times a week? Oh, yeah. Some of us are have, have been at those prayer meetings on Tuesday night. My mom, she didn't bring crackers or Legos. She said, go find a place and cry out to the Lord. That was my instruction from my mom. Go find a place of prayer. Don't play around. Get in the atmosphere of prayer. And you know what? That was instilled in my heart that I could seek God at a young age. I didn't have to be babysit. I didn't have someone to babysit me. I could be in the presence of God at five and six years old and be in these prayer meetings where people were calling for what we're talking about today. They were calling for, for things to go from death to life. They wanted revival. They wanted the outpouring of the Spirit, and they were desperate enough to come out on a Tuesday night when they were tired from working in the oil fields. And they were crying out to the Lord. They were crying out for healing. They were crying out for, for, for his presence to come and change lives. But you know what? All those experiences could not give me the encounter of Jesus. 
they were just dates on my calendar. And can I say, of the Spirit and neglect what the Holy Spirit wants to do. But I believe all three are essential to make us balanced, to give us a balanced diet on what God wants to do. And Jesus reveals all three. They're communing. They're not fighting over who's better. They're talking because Jesus understood, although he was God in flesh, that he needed the Spirit. He understood that there was a need for guidelines. And in that moment, what happens? God speaks. God speaks. God speaks and says, this is my son and whom I'm pleased. And here was the command he gave to them. Listen to him. Now that sounds so simple, right? Listen to him. How many have listened to somebody but not really listened? Maybe your wife, you're watching football, and she comes in and says something, and it's a go, it kind of sounds like wah, 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 wah. Okay, come on. We've all done that, men. We can confess that we're at Real Life Church. At least I have. Guilty. All right, good. We, we can listen. We can listen and not be listening. But I don't believe that what God, what God was telling the disciples here was just to listen with your ears. He was saying, listen with your spirit. Listen with your soul. Listen with all your might. Listen. Don't just listen to gain information. Listen for transformation. So as we go into today's message, here's what I'm asking the Lord to do in your life. As you hear the words, as you hear what, I, what God has spoke to me to give to you today, that you would listen for transformation. Don't walk out of this room the same dude or dudette that you came in. Don't walk in here in and out every week. Be changed from glory to glory and faith to faith. I believe God wants to do that. That we don't get weaker, we become stronger. We don't become more insecure, we become secure. Because we're walking in faith by God. And God is transforming our hearts at our gatherings. And all week long, every day, God is doing this work in our life. And His church is becoming more powerful. All right. Thank you for those three people. You see, 
Jesus understood because sandwiched in between that story of Matthew chapter 17 of God, God's transfiguration, Jesus is telling him what's going to happen to him. I'm going to die. I'm going away. But somewhere in the process of their mind, Jesus is saying that, but what are they not doing? They're not listening. Jesus says it many times. I'm going away. I'm leaving. But somewhere in their heart, they didn't really connect the dots that it was true. See, Christ had to defeat death, hell, and the grave. He had to. And you know what? We do too. We do too. Yes, I understand the principles and the theology that Jesus has already defeated death, hell, and the grave, but he is no longer on the earth. We are. And there is still hell, and there is still death, and there is still the grave. And we must, too, overcome it through the power of Christ. We can't just throw up our hands and say, well, Jesus did it. There's a work to be done, and there's a warfare that we're in right now. That's very real. Now, today you are in a Pentecostal church, and we believe in weapons that are mighty to pulling down strongholds. Now, I don't know what you believe online or you have been taught or or. When I start talking about these types of things, people start going, ooh, this is going to get weird. It's not weird. It's reality. And if you don't believe it's reality, then you might not be alive. Because every day, I can guarantee you, there are influences, there are things happening in your life to keep you from your purpose, to mess you up, to push your buttons. You see, he doesn't have to come with his horns, his pitchfork, and his long tail, the image that we have of the devil. In fact, that's not probably an accurate image of him. The Bible talks about him as being an angel of life. He's deceptive. But he does come. And what he does is he, he knows that in humanity there's wound. And what he'll do is he'll, he'll influence the wound of someone else to get to you. He'll agitate your husband or your wife to push your buttons, to get you off target, to get you off purpose, and off your destiny for that day. He's always scheming. And there has been a current within the body of Christ to kind of well, let's, let's not talk about that stuff. Well, let's kind of put that in the closet because that scares people. But what we have done is we have disarmed people from realizing that there is a real spiritual battle. There is a real confrontation with darkness that is happening every day day even while you sleep at night the enemy is trying to find ways to take us out now we don't live in fear to that because we are fully alive and protected by god but the truth is is we are in this battle and sometimes it's our flesh everybody's dealing with flesh but sometimes there are these influences that happen in our life that are from the very pit of hell. And we have to have a sensitivity of the Lord and the Spirit to know the difference. To know the difference. And in the book of Romans 6, 9 through 11, I want to jump off from this point into our... Um, into our text today in Matthew, Mark chapter 5, if you want to get your Bible there, your iPad or whatever you use. Romans chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. I want to read this passage. It says, For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. Say that. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died he died to sin 
once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, say that with me, in the same way. Not a different way. Not someone else's way. In the same way, count yourself dead to sin. But alive to God in Christ Jesus. He says, in the same way, in the same way that death no longer had mastery over Christ, that hell could not take him out, in that same way, live in life that same way. Stop living in dead places. Stop living with dead thinking. Stop seeing things as impossible. Well, maybe God will do it, maybe he won't. No, stop believing in impossibilities. Because God wants us to cross over from death to life. In fact, Jesus crossed over to bring life to someone who was living among the dead. In the book of Mark chapter 5, and you can also find this in the, in the gospel, I believe, of Luke, or Matthew, Matthew or Luke, Jesus has just finished feeding thousands of people. And he tells his disciples, after this great miracle provision, on one side of the Sea of Galilee, he says, let's get in the boat and let's cross to the other side. Well, on the other side of Galilee was the place of Samaria, the Gentiles, those that didn't have right to God, who were basically considered just people that were useless to the, to the Hebrews. In fact, there was quarrel and an enmity between them still is to this day. But Jesus said, we're going to go to the other side. So when Jesus told the disciples, we're going to go from this side where we know everybody, where it's comfortable, where we're right by Capernaum, where G was, which was Jesus' home base for his ministry, we're leaving what is familiar to go across the lake. Now, the disciples have probably had gone across the lake many times, but what happens on this trip is unusual. Why they're on their way, remember this? A storm begins to brew. And Jesus does what? He goes down in the bottom of the boat and he goes to sleep. And the disciples are freaking out. They're like, we're going to die. We're going to drown. This is it. And these are guys who had probably been in storms on the Sea of Galilee. So this was something that was happening and they wake up Jesus and they say, we're going to die. And Jesus rebukes them again and because of their lack of faith. And he, what? It says that he rebukes the storm and says, peace be still. And he says, everything got calm. And here's where we pick up our text in Mark chapter 5. And they say, they went across the lake to the region of Gar Garasinus, when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tomb and met him. The man lived in the man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been chained hand and foot. But he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. So Jesus is going from one boundary to the next. He's going from a life situation into a death situation. And he's going all the way over the lake. Now, if you get to the end of this text, and we will get there today, 
to get it in a text, Jesus, after he's done in this story, he gets back on the boat to go back to the other side. So it shows me in the text that Jesus knew about this man. And that the enemy, as they're crossing the Sea of Galilee, did everything to prevent him from getting there. But even in the midst of the storm, even in the midst of the trial, Jesus was what? At peace. He was asleep. How many are sleepers like Jesus? I am. Man, you can, you can walk and have a parade in the room and I'm out. Just, that's the peace that God wants us to have in the midst of every trial. That when we lay our head, we know that God has it. Jesus said, let's go to the other side. Jesus, his, the word said, we're going to the other side. If the word says we're going to the other side, guess what? We're going to the other side. You see, the disciples still weren't listening. If God said... He's going to get you there. He's going to get you there. If God has promised in his word, he'll do it. He'll perform it. In Mark chapter 5, continuing on, you see, Jesus went from one side to the other because he saw life's possibilities. He saw through the possibility of life. He saw the death, it was reality. This man's hanging out in dead places. He's hanging him out amongst tombs. He's made his home among the dead. He's made his life. His life is messed up and nobody can do anything about it. It's impossible. They've tried to chain him. They've tried to subdue him. They tried to counsel him. I'm sure they tried a lot of things short of killing him. But they could not do anything. And the picture that we have as Jesus comes to the other side is someone who is in so much torment that they're cutting and hurting their physical bodies. They're so tormented they want to die. They're so tormented and torn up. Death has such a grip on their life that they're crying out. You see, this guy had three strikes already against him when Jesus shows up. First of all, he was Samaritan. Jews didn't deal with Samaritans. He was possessed by spirits. He was demon-possessed. And up in Pine Grove and I passed her there for about three years had this young lady who came had, was divorced had a young beautiful child about three years old and I would preach like I do here pretty simply and at the end of my messages she would come and she would ask question and there would be such confusion now hopefully you don't have that same experience. There was just confusion. And I was like, that's not what I said at all. I didn't say that at all. What were you getting that from? And this was happening month after month, week after. I mean, it was just every week there was this confusion that was there. And I'm like, I'm frustrated. I'm like, 
There just must not, it, it must not be connecting in the synoptics. You know, I'm trying to figure it out on the physical realm why she's not connecting the dots of what I'm saying and living in the truth. And so we started a ministry called Cleansing Streams um, at our church, which is a, a healing and deliverance conference to help people understand these issues and set them free by the Spirit of God. We're in this three months teaching. And in this teaching, it comes out because you do a full disclosure on exposure to the occult, to anything with the new age, anything like that. And this lady had been not only practicing new age, but had been a part of a new age fellowship. And the light went off in my spirit. And I knew what we were dealing with. We weren't dealing with someone who didn't understand. We were dealing with a spirit that would take the truth and twist it. And you know what we did? We took authority over the spirit of confusion, of occultism, of new ageism. We took, a th we took authority so that the spirit of God could have access to her mind and her soul so there would be understanding. And at this conference, she was completely delivered from that. And not only was she delivered to understand, we never had that conversation, thank you, Jesus. Again, God was setting her up to become a pastor's wife. You can't have a spirit of confusion and be in the ministry. See, what was going on? If I can keep her confused, if I can keep her insecure, if I can keep her from seeing the truth, she'll never come in to purpose. We didn't focus on the demonic. We just said, in the name of Jesus, demonic, get out, so that this person could come into their priorities and purpose. It's not glorifying the devil. He doesn't need any glory. It's glorifying the works of Jesus, that he will not go. He'll move beyond any boundary, including a lake, to come to you when he hears your desperate cry. I think so many times we humanize problems that we're facing and we don't have a sensitivity that we may be dealing with something more. And I believe that God wants to change that in our heart. We've been afraid. We've been embarrassed. We don't want to be wrong. But I believe that there are things in the Spirit that have to be dealt with by the Spirit of God that can't be counseled, they can't be medicated. They cannot be dealt with. They have to be delivered. And all the way through Jesus' ministry and Paul's ministry, there was deliverance happening. It is biblical. It is there. And it is for the church. And it is a power that the enemy has tried to keep away from the church so that he could run wild and do what he wants and influence people's hearts. All right. Let's move into the text again. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, And when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want from me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, do not torture me. For Jesus, he said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. And then Jesus asked, he asked him, what's your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. Here's the next thing I want you to know. You've got to check your ID. You got to know who you are in Christ. If you're going to move people from death to life, you better know who you're representing. You better not be going in your name. Check your ID. Make sure that your passport has Jesus' picture right there. 
that the image of Christ is in your life. What happens? Immediately, this man comes to confront Jesus. It wasn't like, welcome to our island. Welcome to my tomb. He wasn't coming out to friendly greet him. Welcome to Samaria. He was coming to confront and keep Jesus from taking territory. And this spirit recognized who Jesus was immediately. And Jesus says, well, let me check out your ID. And this man didn't say, well, I'm Tom and I live over here. This is what I do for a living. No, he says, he, Jesus is by authority saying, what's inside you? I, I don't care about what you do and what your name is. I want to know what's underneath the hood. I don't want to, I don't want to flesh it out with you. I want to look in the spirit and see. I want to discern what's going on here. Why are you thrashed? Why are you beat up? Why are you broken? Why are you coming? How do you know who I am? And all these bells and flags are going off in Jesus' spirit. And he discerns an impure spirit. And he doesn't play around with the demon. He doesn't make it like spin and twirl and throw up like we see in movies. None of that happens, right? None of that happens. It doesn't be turned into a... nice. There is not a peace treaty coming between him and Lucifer. The cross was about defeating him. And sometimes we're trying to play nice with spirits. We're trying to play nice. Like, if you just leave me alone, the old mic now he's still I'm still working on getting him completely crucified and dead but Christ came alive in me the life I live in body and he's talking Paul's talking to the church of Galatia he says I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me your ID is important what you identify with is important and is key, is key to victory. It's key to overcoming those things of death. They're going to come and they're going to come. 
and they don't always growl and head spin. They, they, sometimes they come very deceptively. They look like Christians. In fact, the Bible tells us that we're to discern the spirits because there are many false prophets in the earth, false teachers. We need to have discernment in order to be able to tell, is this God or is this flesh? And if we don't have our discerners in tune with the spirit, we're going to miss it. All right, I've got to wrap this message up. So we know in verse 11, that this man pleads the demons within the spirits are pleading, like, put us in the pigs, put us in the pigs. That's interesting that he puts them in pigs because to the Jews, that's an unclean animal. And so Jesus says, okay. And these pigs do what? They run and they go off the cliff and they drown. The end, right? Not the end. Because in verse 14, it says, those tending the pigs ran off and reported this to the town and the countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. So Jesus is draw drawing a crowd by what has just happened. And when they came to Jesus, they saw him sitting there dressed and in his right mind. Now listen, the miracle here isn't demons going into pigs. That's the sideshow. The miracle is someone who is tormented, crying out, thought to be crazy, living amongst the dead, is now dressed with clothes on, seated and in their right mind. In their right mind. This man is free. He has moved from death to life. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to this demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people begin to plead with Jesus, save us. No, what does it say? Please leave our region. Please get out of here. We were okay with crazy Tom. We were okay with how things were. You've messed things up. You've created more problems for us. We had things handled. And they say, Jesus, we need you to leave. And here's what I want you to know. Realize that not everyone will cross over from death to life. Not everybody will. There's going to be resistors. There's going to be those that are like, get out of here. There's those that won't be ready. Not everybody will cross over. But Jesus, I believe, didn't come for everybody. He came from this man. And it says, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been Demopus says, begged him, please let me go with you. Don't leave me with these guys. Something had changed in him. He knew the authentic. He knew something was real and different about Jesus because he could do what his friends couldn't. He could do what chains couldn't. He could do what counseling could not. And I believe in counseling, Christian counseling. But here's what I want you to see as we close. Jesus doesn't say, okay, let me rescue you and take you to the other side where it's paradise. Because it wasn't. He knew this man would be out of his element and would be rejected by those on the other side of the, of the lake. 
So Jesus says to him, go to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. So the, it says the man went on his way and began to tell the Decapolis, which is basically the Jordan region, how much Jesus had done for him. And listen to this. All who heard were amazed. Now listen, I want you to notice something in this story. Jesus at the end of this deliverance didn't get up and pontificate, didn't preach a message. He just dropped the mic and he says, let the authenticity of life speak for itself. See, sometimes when God does miracles or he does a deliverance, we got to know how he did it. We want to figure it out so we can find a methodology so we can repeat and rinse, repeat and rinse. And that's not what Jesus did. Jesus wasn't saying, go into, get in your boat and go cross Berryessa to find demon-possessed people and deliver them. That it was not the model Jesus was doing. What he was showing up, his church was the authority, the disciples and his church was the authority that can happen. That even when you meet something that is messed up and everyone has given up on it, nobody wants to touch it and, we, and they're just tolerating it. That you can step in by the Spirit. And you can say, in the name of Jesus, come out. And people can be clothed with righteousness. People can be sit seated, not stressed out, and in their right mind. In their right mind. Jesus let the authenticity of life speak for itself. He gets back on the boat and goes on his way. What does this man do? I'm not going with Jesus. Jesus came to set the captives free. Isaiah 61. It was the first thing he read as he came out of the wilderness full of the power of the Spirit. Open the scroll. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He anointed me to break open the doors of the captive, declare freedom. Jesus came to set people free. So if Jesus came to set people free, guess what, folks? He's called His church to that same freedom. He's called you and I to not look at impossible situations people who are struggling with identity issues and say, man, that's just their problem over there. No, God wants people of the Spirit to step in those situations and say, that's not your identity. Your identity is this. This is what God says about you. And bring them from death into life. To bring the destruction that is going to happen because of them taking on something that God hasn't placed on them. And God steps into those moments with people of faith and power. And they bring. what God's looking for in his church so God as we stand before you we understand that our battle is not flesh and blood apostle Paul says but our weapons are mighty to pulling down and the destruction of strongholds that we wrestle against principalities and powers in the air spiritual beings and 
influences that are meant to destroy us. Jesus in John 10, 10 says, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He has one aim. He said, I've come that you might have life and life to the full. So today, as we move into that life, I want to pray over us. Jesus, I pray by your spirit that you would move upon us. I pray, God, right now that you would settle in our hearts. And Lord, we would be willing like our Savior to cross over, to bring people from death to life. And Lord, today we may need to cross over. There may be some things going on in our heart. There may be some oppression. There may be some things that we need freedom from. And so I say in the name of Jesus, be set free. In the name of Jesus, where the Spirit of the Lord is and He is here, there is freedom for you. There is deliverance for you. There, you don't have to deal with the habit another day. There is freedom for you. You may be up online. I want to declare to you, there's freedom for you and your household. So today, God, as we move into and continue this series, Lord, we are crossing over into death, death and life, and we're going to be people who are crossing over continually from death to life. We pray this in the mighty and the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap today? Hey, before, we, before I leave today, I wanted to say a couple things to you. I want to remind you of all of our giving links, all of our social media links. There'll be a slide in just a minute that we'll go through. It's a banner and it'll have all that information on there. If you're not connected to our weekly newsletter, you're not getting our information, our text alerts when we send those out. We want to make sure that you're connected with us. Even if you're online today, the information is there. You can scan the QR code for our giving links. And, and let's continue. Uh, if you're committed to giving to Kingdom Builders, let us know by filling out our online uh, commitment form for, uh, for giving to Kingdom Builders. God is doing some incredible things even today through Kingdom Builders and, in, and through this church. So we want to be a part of that, of crossing over to bring death to life. We're believing God's best for you today as you live out real life. Thanks for being with you. Make sure to stand and hug someone's neck. God bless.